Our text for this morning's message is taken from Psalm 3. Let us first look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the return of another worship service. It is the Lord's day, the day our Lord Jesus was risen from the dead. And we come to worship the Almighty God. And even as we come, we plead for thy mercy, that thou would forgive us of all our sins, sins that we have committed against thee in our speech, in our thoughts, in our deeds, that thou will cleanse us by the precious blood of thy only begotten Son. We thank thee for thy precious word that thou hast inspired and preserved, perfect, that we can hold in our hands to read for ourselves, and even as a church, as a corporate body, we come to consider thy truth. We need thy word at every moment of our lives. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we pray that thou will continue to teach us, even this day, whatever thou would intend to teach us, May the Spirit of God be our divine teacher to illumine our minds and convict our hearts that all of us will not just be hearers only, but we will be doers of thy word as well. Grant to thy servant the words to speak. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nothing can be worse in life than being in trouble. What can be more painful when the trouble comes from someone closest to you? When your husband, your wife, or your children have turned against you and are trying to do harm to you. This was exactly what happened to David when he had to flee from his son Absalom. This is the first of 14 Davidic Psalms that starts with an introduction which states the actual historical event that caused David to write the psalm. So you see how it begins. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. If you look down to Psalm 30, there's another psalm that has an introduction. It says, a psalm and song at the dedication of the house of David. So the historical background of this psalm was that as the king of Israel, David was occupied with the affairs of his government. While in the meantime, his own son Absalom was stealing the hearts of the people and planning a rebellion in a nearby city called Hebron. David was caught off guard. The rebellion was unexpected. And he had no opportunity to know how to respond. Neither he has the ability to respond. All he could do was to flee from his own son. As David ran down the capital, Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley, and all the way over Mount of Olives, into the desert, the Bible tells us that he was weeping. He was barefooted, and his head was covered with sorrow. How could he not be sorrowful when his own son was seeking to kill him? On top of that, his own trusted advisor and counsellor, Ahitophel, turned against him and supported Absalom. Ahitophel even advised Absalom to take his father's concubines in order to show to all Israel that he was repulsive 
towards his own father. Then along the way, David met a man called Simei, a Benjamite, who was very loyal to the house of Saul. As he saw David and his men, he was casting stones and openly cursing David. He said, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, thou a man of Belial, which means son of the devil. The Lord has repaid all the things that you have done to the house of Saul. He had removed the kingdom and gave it to your son. He will destroy you because you are a man of blood. You can read about that in Numbers 13. That is just a brief background of Psalm 3. So you can imagine how devastated David would be. Running away from his own son, who was trying to kill him. Being betrayed by his trusted advisor and counsellor, Ahitophel. And the people casting stones at him, openly cursing him. That was his situation. My friends, you may not be running away from someone who is seeking your life, but most certainly you would have faced all kinds of troubles. In life, it is inevitable that there will be troubles. How much more the troubles that come from someone closest to you? Perhaps you are facing tremendous opposition in your workplace from your colleagues and subordinates who are working closely with you all these years. All of a sudden, everyone is trying to destroy everyone else. Everywhere you turn, you see troubles, gossips, lies, false accusations, misrepresentations, and even violence, perhaps not physical, but verbal. Or you may face trouble in your own home. Your children, they may hate you and constantly rebel against you. Your wife, whom you thought has always trusted your work, supported your work and ministry, all of a sudden speaks against what you believe in and even join others to challenge and oppose you. In such times, what can you do? Who can you turn to? Well, we can learn from the psalmist David and see how he responded in such a situation. The title of our message is Having Confidence in Times of Trouble. Firstly, we see this expression of trouble. Let's begin with verse 1. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be we say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Sila. Sila means a pause. Rest or be silent. If the psalmist is singing this psalm, then this would be a musical pause. If the psalmist was reading this psalm, this would be the time for him to pause and think. The word trouble means adversary or enemy. Notice how David described his enemies. They are many. They are rising up. And they was saying all kinds of things. And in verse 6, he described his enemies as 10,000 of people. In other words, there was a great multitude. And they were saying to David, there is no help for him in God, which means even your own God 
cannot help you. Isn't it true that in times of trouble, there will always be some people who will say all kinds of things about our God, that He does not love us, that He has forsaken us, that He has forgotten all about us, in order to cause us to doubt our faith, even our salvation, and then to question our God. I'm not saying that God does not discipline those whom He loves. There is a difference between punishing us and disciplining us. One is motivated by love, the other is by wrath. Our Lord Jesus, when He died on the cross of Calvary, He bore our sins and took upon Himself the wrath of God on behalf of you and me. So we do not need to face the wrath of God as in His punishment. But from time to time, God may discipline us if necessary because of our sins. And that is because of His love. Do you realize something very interesting about troubles? Whenever we focus on the trouble or the enemy, whatever it may be, somehow the enemy will seem to grow in size and then it will overwhelm us. But the moment we turn our attention to God, that is when our enemy will become smaller and smaller. One classic example is found in a very familiar account. Remember, Joshua, Caleb, and the ten spies who were sent out to scout the land of Canaan before the Israelites entered to conquer the promised land. The ten spies were overwhelmed by the size and the strength of the Canaanites, especially the descendants of Enoch. They were like giants. And they came back with this report saying, we cannot fight against those people. They were much stronger than us. They were like giants. To them, we are just like grasshoppers. But for Joshua and Caleb, it was totally the opposite. They came back and they said to the people, let us go up at once and possess the land, for we are well able to overcome it. You can read about that in Numbers 13. Both the ten spies, Joshua and Caleb, saw the same enemies in the promised land. What was the difference? The ten spies only focused on the enemies, forgot all about God. When they do that, the enemies became bigger and bigger. And as the enemies became bigger and bigger in their own eyes, they became smaller and smaller in their own eyes. And then they said, we are like grasshoppers. But Joshua and Caleb kept their eyes on the Almighty God. And for them, it was the giants which became smaller. That was exactly what David did. Indeed, the enemies were real. They were there. David said they were increasing in numbers. They were rising. They were saying all kinds of things. But instead of focusing on the enemies, he looked to the Almighty God. And he said in verse 3, But thou, O Lord, when David did that, 
he was reminded of how strong his God was, how mighty and powerful his God was. And his enemies, no matter how powerful they were, they did not seem to bother him anymore. This is a wonderful lesson for all of us to learn and to remember. You and I may be surrounded by all kinds of troubles, physical problems, emotional problems, relationship problems, financial problems, health problems, etc. No matter how devastating the trouble is, we need to pause. As the word sila suggests to us, pause and then turn to the Almighty God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and we are always in His presence. And if we are conscious of His presence, we are conscious of the knowledge of who our God is and all the promises He has given to us in the Bible, then, though the problems may still be there, but they will become smaller and smaller because of who our God is. Our second point is an expression of the confidence. Let us look at verse 3. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Silla. So David was surrounded by his enemies. And the only one he could trust and rely on was the Almighty God. His closest people had abandoned him, but he knew for sure God would never forget, neither would he forsake him. Three important things gave David much confidence. Look at the passage. Firstly, he said, Thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Remember, David was a military man, and so here he used military terms. No soldier in his right frame of mind would enter into the battlefield without a shield. The shield would be his only source of defense and protection. In other words, David knew that God was his only defense and protection, without which he could never fight a good fight. Likewise, you and I, we are spiritual soldiers. We are fighting a spiritual warfare. Without this shield, without God being our protector, we can never fight. Have you ever encountered someone who shared with you about his or her problems? Surely you have. Right? And then you try to encourage the person to trust in God. Trust in the Bible. But the moment you mention God, the person brushed it aside and then went on to talk about his problems. Just Keep on talking about those problems. And then finally, the person said, well, I have no choice but to persevere. Deep down in your heart, you knew that this person would lose the fight. Why? Because he has no protection. Without God being his protector, how can he fight this spiritual warfare? He can talk about all his problems, all he wants, but he can never win the battle. You and I can never fight a good fight of faith if God is not our shield. He is our protector. 
and He must be our protector. Secondly, David said, My glory and the lifter up of my head. In times of victory, the soldier would have this dignity and honor, and his head would be lifted up. Not in a proud sense, but with dignity and honor. But in times of defeat, he would be walking without this glory. He will be walking with his head hang down in shame. Have you ever been discouraged and disappointed? Especially when you have failed. And people are lashing out at you, saying all kinds of nasty things about you. And you are facing all kinds of troubles. You are so depressed. You feel as if you are a loser. You do not need to wallow in self-pity. You can be like David who said, O Lord, thou art my glory. Can you imagine the glory of God will never be diminished? And here is this believer seeking after this glory of God which will never be diminished. When we pray for deliverance, we pray for blessings, we pray for healings, we pray for strength to do the work set before us, we are not asking for self-justifications or self-enjoyment or self-glorification. We are not just seeking after things just for the sake of being proven right. But we are seeking the glory of our God. We want the whole world to know that this is our God. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come and believe in Him. This is our glorified Savior. And God who knows all things, He knows. If you and I are seeking after His glory. Or we are just seeking after our own personal interest. He knows everything. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Thirdly, David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me. When God hears, he answers. He always answers. Though not always according to what we want. Because what we want may not be best for us. Only God alone knows what is best for us. Sometimes, God does not give it to us. Why? Because we ask for the wrong thing. Remember, James 4 verse 3 says, Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss. You miss it. You ask for the wrong thing. And then, what is the motivation? That ye may consume it upon your lust. Our motivation is also wrong. We want to be consumed in our own lust, our own desires. Nothing to do with the glory of God. And God knows, so He does not give it to us. And other times, God does not give it to us simply because we do not even ask. We do not even pray for it. Again, the word sila is very telling because it was as if the psalmist paused to think in times of trouble, God was his shield, God was his protector, God was the one who lifted up his head, and then God was the one who answered his prayers. And what was the outcome of all that? Well, this brings us to our last point. An expression of the deliverance. Verse 5. I laid me down and slept. I awake, for the Lord sustained me. 
There were many enemies surrounding David. His own son was seeking after his life. Yet night after night, he would go to sleep and rest. And then wake up the next morning. How was he able to do that? The answer is simply, for the Lord sustained me. It was the Lord who had kept him through the night. It was the Lord who had given him a good night rest. Again, the problems might still be there. The problems did not disappear. But what it meant was that David was able to entrust all his concerns, his cares, his worries, his anxieties to the Almighty God. And then he went to sleep. Woke up, refreshed. I know some of us here may be thinking, it is easier said than done. I want to sleep. Who doesn't want? I really want to trust God and sleep well. But with all the troubles I'm facing in my life, in my family, how can I go to sleep and have a good night rest? Again, there are several important points for us to take note. What are the things that will often cause people to lose sleep? Take a moment and consider this. One for sure would be past regrets. For example, people keep thinking about those things that they have done wrong in the past, wrong decisions, and that will bring about guilt and it will bother them a lot. So much so they will not be able to sleep. Second, it will be present realities. The things they are facing at this very moment. Perhaps there's a lump in the chest which may be cancerous. Or the company is not doing well. You may be retrenched. And you may struggle to put bread and butter on the table. And then there's also the future unknowns. Things in the future that you are so concerned about. What will I be in five years' time? Will I get married? Will I have children? If I have children, will I be able to take care of my children? Dear friend, you realize that all these things that I've just mentioned, past regrets, present realities, future unknowns, are things none of us is in control of. Why should we be concerned about all these things that we have absolutely no control of? Why don't we just turn all these things to the only one who is in control of all things? Our God. He's in control of all things. Secondly, we must remember that even a good night rest cometh from the Lord. He's the one who sustained us throughout the night. Recently, a doctor in my church said to me, medication can put a person to sleep, but it cannot give a person a good night rest. As in, feeling rested. How true. God is the giver of all these blessings, including a good night rest. Do you agree? You can take all the medications you want. you wake up feeling lousy, having headaches, and you know that you have not rested well. Only God alone is able to provide the peace of mind 
the good night rest. And thirdly, we must train ourselves to entrust all our concerns to God. It does not come automatically. It does not come to us all of a sudden. I want to go to sleep well. I want it, I have it. No, it does not work that way. So we have to live through each day of our lives using the strength that God has given to us to do the work set before us faithfully. At the end of the day, before we go to bed, we pray, Lord, thank you for giving me the strength to do the work set before me throughout this day. I've done to the best of my abilities by thy grace and mercy. The problems may still be there, but I need to go to sleep. Give me a good night rest so I will wake up tomorrow morning refreshed, rejuvenated, and restored to fight a new fight, to face new challenges for the next day. When we do that on a daily basis, gradually, slowly, we will learn to cast all our cares to Him. We will go to bed. We will sleep. God is faithful and He will give us a good night rest. Just like David, although he was surrounded by all these horrendous troubles being pursued by his own son, betrayed by his own advisor, yet night after night he slept and he says, the Lord sustained me. When he was refreshed, he said in verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people and have set themselves against me round about. We all know that David was a brave man. Even as a young man, he was already brave, bold, courageous. All the other Israelites were afraid of Goliath. But there was this young man who said, I will fight him. And here, we know the reason why he was so brave. It was not because he had any supernatural powers, but because his confidence was in the Lord. One of the bravest men in history was known as Oliver Cromwell. In the 1600s, he became known as the protector of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And he trained a first-class army and navy. When he was asked about his bravery, he simply said this, Because I fear God, I fear no other man. What a statement. Because I fear God, there was no man I fear. We pray that all of us will be able to say, because we fear God, there is no man and nothing we fear in this life. Look at verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. To smite the enemies in the cheekbone means to show reproach or contempt. The ungodly are like beasts, animals, and their strength is in the way they devour their prey. So to break the teeth of the ungodly means to break their power. Remove their power. So much so that they are now powerless. David was very familiar with this because he has seen how the Lord 
had shown his reproach to his past enemies, like the Philistines, the Edomites, the Syrians, how he had removed their power. So here he was saying, Lord, save me. Like how you have done in the past. You have done to my past enemies, the Philistines, the Edomites, the Syrians. Save me, deliver me. Remember at the beginning of our message, we said that he was running away from his son, Absalom, who was trying to kill him. And even his trusted, or once trusted advisor, Ahitophel, had turned against him. And there were people accusing him, throwing stones at him, cursing him. Did God save David from all these primary enemies? Most certainly. You know what happened? Well, Absalom took in bad advice. Because of that, he was not able to defeat his own father when David was most weak. And when David was able to gather up his strength, he got all his men together and he fought. 20,000 men were killed, including Absalom. Ahitophel was so disappointed that Absalom did not listen to him, he went and he hanged himself. What about Shimei? Shimei, who cursed at David, had to eat his own words. He was humiliated in front of David, in the presence of his family and friends. Later on, he was killed during Solomon's time because he continued to rebel. You see, God did not just give David a good night rest. He took care of everything. When David entrusted all his concerns to God, God took care of of everything. If I can give you a picture of how David was, it would be like he was at the bottom of the valley. When he started this psalm, he was at the lowest point. And then he paused and he looked up to God and expressed all his troubles to the Lord. And it appeared as if he was climbing up the mountain. And then he reached half point. And that was when he expressed his confidence in God and he said, You are my shield. You are my protector. You are the one who has lifted up my head. You are the one who has answered my prayers. And from there, with great confidence, he continued to climb. And at the end of this psalm, it was as if he was at the summit, at the top. Read together with me verse 8. Let's read together. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. Isn't it true? He began at the lowest point, And it appeared as if he was climbing up this mountain. And now, at verse 8, he ended on a heightened note. And he said, Salvation belongeth to the Lord. God is the one who saves. And he is the one who bless. Dear friends, Whatever troubles you may be facing at this moment. Life may be very harsh on you. It may not be merciful to you. You may be facing tremendous oppositions. But remember, when you only look to the problem, and you forget about God. 
you will be like the ten spies. You will become smaller and smaller. Your problems will become bigger and bigger. But if you are like Joshua and Caleb, you look to the Almighty God. You know who He is. You are conscious of His presence. You are conscious of the knowledge of God and His promises. And then, it will be the giants who will become smaller. And then you start to clamp, like David clamped. And you express your confidence. God is my shield. God is my protector. And I live my life for His glory. And He knows. And He will guide and lead me. And finally, you will end on the victorious note. That is when you will sing like David. Salvation belongeth to the Lord. I cried out to the Lord to save me. Spiritually, He saved me. When I need financial salvation, I need physical salvation, I cried out to Him too. And He saves me too. And He's the one who blesses. And He blesses those whom He loves. This is our greatest comfort. Having confidence in troubled times. Look to the Lord. Trust in Him. Your confidence is in Him, not in yourself. And then you will end on the victorious note. By God's grace and mercy. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy precious word that brings great comfort to our hearts. Thou knoweth what we are going through. Thou knoweth what is lurking ahead of us. We are not all-knowing. But oftentimes, like the ten spies, we look to our problems and forget Thee. We forget that the God whom we believe in is powerful, strong, mighty, and great. And He loves us with an everlasting, perfect love. Yet, we are so overwhelmed by the things of this world, be it our past regrets, or our present realities, or our future unknowns. We are so troubled by these things, which none of us is in control of. O oh Lord, teach us to cast all our cares, concerns, worries, our lives into the hands of the one who is in control of all things. Thou alone. Thou art our confidence. Our lives on this earth is like a vapour. It appeareth for a little time, and then vanishes away. We are mindful of that truth. Help us to look to the one who gives to us eternal life, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega. Help us to build our confidence in thee and thee alone. And like David, we want to sing every day of our lives, salvation belongeth to the Lord. And thou art the one who blesses those whom thou loves. We give thee thanks and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.